unidentified body turns up in the woods of North Carolina. With no motive and no suspects, investigators struggle to find the killer. In California, a housewife is taken into custody. When no record of her arrest turns up, detectives begin to fear the worst. A tragic horse accident ends the life of a Montana woman. But examiners uncover the markings of murder. When a crime scene yields vague clues, detectives must piece together their case through other means. Forensic science has found ways to uncover motive, exposing those who kill for love or money. North Carolina's northwest corner is dominated by rugged terrain, its landscape untouched by the problems of city life. That was about to change. On January 7, 1994, a Department of Transportation worker surveyed some land near a rural highway. He made a horrifying discovery. Investigators from the Watauga County Sheriff's Department were called to the scene. Hidden among the overgrowth, they found a body. Though the cool weather helped preserve the body, investigators determined he had been there for some time. The victim, a male in his 30s or 40s, had gunshot wounds on the left temple and the right side of the neck. The body was completely nude except for a watch and ring on his left hand. But other than the jewelry, there wasn't much evidence to identify the victim or tie him to his killer. Investigators scoured the scene around the body, searching for any scrap of evidence. A few feet from the body, they found a piece of black electrical tape. The single strand of tape was collected and sent to the crime lab for analysis. Captain Paula Townsend worked the case. Hoping to identify the John Doe, she entered what little information she had into the police database. We knew that we did not have any outstanding missing persons in our county, so we would have to make some effort to locate uh, uh, a missing person from another area and determine his identity. They didn't have to wait long. Later that evening, Detectives got a call from police in nearby Salisbury. A man in their town had been reported missing several weeks before. He fit the description of the dead body found along the road. His name was Victor Gunnarsson. Salisbury police agreed to forward their case file. An autopsy showed that two bullets to the head had ended the victim's life. Analysis of the stomach showed the presence of undigested potatoes eaten within five hours of his murder. Thank you. Townsend searched through Gunnarsson's case file, looking for any clue that could help her identify him as the victim. There was nothing conclusive. But if Gunnarsson was the victim, Townsend learned he had a sensational past. Victor Gunnarsson was actually a Swedish national um, he had come to the United States seeking political asylum because he had actually been uh, criminally charged with assassinating the Prime Minister Olaf Palme in Sweden a few years earlier. Gunnarsson had been held as the primary suspect in the assassination, but was released when no witnesses could identify him as the killer. Watauga investigators were having a similar problem. To confirm that the body was his, Investigators requested his fingerprints, 
which were on file at Interpol. A week after the body was found, the prints arrived in North Carolina. They matched. Now, police had to determine why someone wanted Victor Gunnarsson dead. His notorious past could not be ignored. When we uh, learned about what had happened to him in Sweden, we didn't know if it was related or not. Um, we did have to consider that possibility that uh, there was some political motivation in his death. The small town murder had huge international implications. But as investigators probed Gunnarsson's final days, they learned he had other problems close to home. In January, having heard about the case on the news, a woman named Kay Whedon came forward to make a statement. She'd met Gunnarsson on Thanksgiving and had been out with him several times that week. About two months ago. But after their last date on December 3rd, she hadn't heard from him again. That night, he'd taken her out to dinner. Whedon confirmed that Gunnarsson had eaten a baked potato at that time. Based on the autopsy results, investigators knew that this was his last meal. After dinner, Whedon invited him back to her place. But they were not alone. Whedon's ex-boyfriend, L.C. Underwood, and a friend named Shelley Thompson cruised by the house around 11 p.m. It wasn't a friendly visit. Kay Whedon described her stormy two-year relationship with Underwood to police. Though they'd broken up, he refused to let her out of his life. Um, he had stalked her for some time. He was very jealous and obsessive. Um, there were several incidents where um, he had confronted her um, when she was with another date. And the fact that he drove by on the night of December 3rd when Victor Gunnarsson was in her house um, caused him to um, be a suspect in this case. The theory that Gunnarsson was the target of a political assassination was losing its credibility. L.C. Underwood's obsessive jealousy made him a prime suspect in the Swedes' murder. But it wouldn't be an easy case to pursue. In addition to being a suspect, he was also a cop. L.C. Underwood had been in law enforcement for 19 and a half years. He began his law enforcement career in uh, Wilkesboro, North Carolina, and he later moved through a couple of other agencies before he finally moved to Salisbury, and he had been a police officer in Salisbury for um, about eight years. Pointing the finger at a police officer is tricky business. If investigators' suspicions about Underwood were wrong, they'd be destroying a colleague's professional and personal life. But if they were correct, they'd be fighting an uphill battle against someone who knew how to hide evidence. To make their case, investigators would have to stay one step ahead of Underwood. Instead of confronting him directly, detectives began by questioning the people around him. Shelley Thompson had been in the car when the suspect drove by Whedon's house. Underwood had told her that he was doing a favor for a friend when he drove by and jotted down Gunnarsson's license plate number. I don't know Thompson said happened. that when they returned to his house, he called the station and asked a colleague to run the plates. Had you had any contact? Investigators Personal confirmed work. that Underwood was given Gunnarsson's name and address that night. The information was enough for police to obtain a warrant to search Underwood's home. They were about to confront a fellow police officer, a prime suspect in their murder investigation. As they searched his house, investigators asked Underwood what he knew about Victor Gunnarsson's murder. Not only did Underwood deny any knowledge of the crime, he claimed he'd never even heard the name before. The suspect had just been caught in a lie. But that didn't prove murder. Investigators needed solid physical evidence to connect him to the crime. The initial search of the immaculate home contributed nothing to the case. 
If Underwood had killed the Swede, he was too smart and too organized to leave a smoking gun. The only way to catch him would be to find less obvious clues in unexpected places. Behind the washing machine, they noticed something they had seen before. A piece of black electrical tape, like the one found near Victor Gunnarsson's body. It appeared the meticulous cop had underestimated his colleague's determination. Watauga County, North Carolina police struggled to solve the murder of 38-year-old Victor Gunnarsson. In the home of the prime suspect, police officer L.C. Underwood, here, come on back over here. investigators found a critical piece of evidence, black electrical tape. One particular piece of tape that was found on the back of um, Underwood's dryer in his utility room was consistent in um, several ways with the tape that was found at the crime scene near Victor Gunnarsson's body. The unlikely clue was turned over to the Trace Evidence Department at the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation. Technicians compared the sample with the tape found at the crime scene. Trace evidence expert Troy Hamlin studied and compared the characteristics of the two samples. The physical dimensions were compared, the width, the thickness, the composition was also compared, which were inorganic and organic characteristics. All of these were consistent with one another, and therefore those two items of evidence could have originated from the same roll of tape. It was a key finding, but the case against Underwood couldn't be made on the tape evidence alone. Detectives needed something to physically link the suspect directly to the victim. They obtained a warrant to search his car. But like his house, the vehicle was impeccably clean. Even the trunk was spotless. Still, investigators refused to simply walk away. The trunk liner was removed and sent to the lab for closer analysis. That, too, would be a struggle. The liner had been recently washed and vacuumed, removing a great deal of trace evidence in the process. Using sticky tape, Examiner Troy Hamlin went over every square inch of the liner, searching for any microscopic clue that survived the cleaning. He found nothing. The veteran police officer, it seemed, was getting away with murder. But then, Hamlin spotted a minuscule clue that could potentially have enormous value. He plucked a single hair root, barely visible to the naked eye. Probing more carefully at that area of the carpet, he was able to extract 17 more hairs deeply embedded in the weave. Hairs collected from the victim and those found in the carpeting were mounted on slides and analyzed under a comparison microscope. The microscopic analysis showed that the hairs were physically indistinguishable. Detectives finally had the break they needed. When I received a phone call from the lab analyst who told me that he had found the head hair in uh, Underwood's trunk mat that was consistent with Victor Gunnarsson's, I was ecstatic. But if their entire physical case was going to hang by this microscopic evidence, Investigators needed irrefutable proof. Examiners determined that the hair contained enough material for a DNA analysis. The tests confirmed that the DNA sequence from the hair found in the trunk of the suspect's vehicle was the same as the DNA sequence taken from the victim's blood. With Underwood now physically linked to the murder victim, police finally had the evidence they needed. A warrant was obtained for his arrest. Underwood's game of cat and mouse had come to an end. Police theorized that on December 3rd, 
having seen his ex-girlfriend with another man, Underwood became enraged with jealousy. He paid a late night visit to Gunnarsson's apartment and abducted his rival. With his victim tied up inside the trunk, Underwood drove for over an hour before arriving at Gunnarsson's final destination. He fired two shots into Gunnarsson's head, then began the process of covering up his crime. In July of 1997, L. C. Underwood was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. Fueled by jealous rage, L. C. Underwood would stop at nothing to keep Kay Wheaton in his life. Others will use manipulation and murder as a means to satisfy their desires. An hour north of Los Angeles, the Pacific Coast Highway winds its way through Ventura, a city of beautiful beaches, a thriving harbor, and a close-knit community. On May 6, 1996, Michael Daly contacted the Ventura Police Department to report his wife Sherry missing. He told police that his wife had driven their boys to school early that morning. When it came time to pick the children up three hours later, she didn't show. The 35-year-old woman was known as a loving and responsible mother. It wasn't like her to forget her children. He said that his wife had planned to do some shopping earlier in the day. No one had heard from her since. Detective Sean Conroy of the Ventura Police Department worked the case. He knew from experience that Sherry may have gone missing on purpose. Well, the reaction to any missing persons case is uh, generally, uh, if a full-grown adult is missing, it's because they want to be missing. But concerned family members didn't believe that Sherry would leave her children. They drove around town until they spotted Sherry's van in the parking lot of a discount store. They contacted police. Inside the vehicle, investigators found her keys, purse, and a Mother's Day gift she'd purchased at the store. There were no other clues, nor any indication of a struggle. The following day, detectives convened for their regular weekly meeting. One of the officers mentioned that a Ventura resident had called in about having seen a strange arrest the day before. It was in the same parking lot where Sherry Daly's van was found. One of, was one of these the, they paid a visit to the witness. The saw, he said he saw a woman fitting Sherry's description, That's being right. handcuffed by a blonde woman in a tan suit. The blonde appeared to be a law enforcement officer. He then saw the woman in handcuffs being placed into a green car and driven away. The witness tried to catch the license plate, but it appeared to have been masked over. Investigators were now hopeful that Sherry was not missing at all. At that time, we felt that another uh, police agency had come in our jurisdiction and made an arrest without notifying us. And we felt that by making a few phone calls uh, that we would discover uh, that the person in the missing persons report, Sherry Daly, had been arrested and uh, we had solved the case and, uh, with just a few hours work. But any hope for a speedy resolution was Last soon crushed. Was in, uh, no law enforcement officer from Ventura or any other jurisdiction had any record of such an incident. Police now believe they had a kidnapping on their hands. And with no communication from the kidnapper, they feared they might also be looking at a homicide. Detectives wanted to interview Michael Daly in greater detail. But when they went to talk to him, they found him with another woman. Her name was Diana Hahn. Both right, were brought so in for questioning. Tell me about 
Detective Skip Afternoon. Young interviewed Michael Daly. In our first several conversations with Michael, he did not appear to be the worried, frantic, uh, concerned husband that you or I may be. Uh, he was very matter of fact, uh, didn't have a reasonable explanation as to why his wife would leave him. Daly told police that at the time of his wife's disappearance, he'd been at the grocery store where he worked. The alibi checked out. Daly's girlfriend, Diana Hahn, denied any knowledge of Sherry's whereabouts. But it wasn't her statement that raised suspicions. Hidden beneath her bangs, Hahn sported some fresh scratches. She claimed she'd had a bike accident and tumbled over the handlebars. Investigators weren't buying the story. Uh, we know from years of police experience that it is impossible for someone to fall over the handlebars of a bike without putting their hands out to break their fall. It's an automatic reflex. Uh, yet she had no injuries on her hands, she had no injuries on her knees. We knew at that point that she was lying to us. Place the ruler up against the bruise. Photographs of the injury were taken. Thank In the you. pictures, more, investigators could also see faint bruising on her arms and hands. It appeared that someone had gripped her so tightly that they even caused bruises to her fingers. Police suspected that Han was involved in the kidnapping. She didn't own a green car, but she could have rented one. Investigators canvassed rental car agencies in the Ventura County area. They learned that a car was rented the day before Sherry's disappearance and returned the day after with 126 miles put on it. The name of the renter, records showed, was Diana Hahn. Her credit card had been used to pay for the car, and her signature was noted on the form. Okay. Detective Conroy hoped uh, that an examination of the rented vehicle would help them find out what happened to Sherry Daly. Even though the abduction had happened, you know, at least a week prior to this, uh, the rental agency had not re-rented the car. Uh, we asked them why. Uh, the car had been returned with the rearview mirror knocked off of the front windshield. Investigators confirmed the car rented by Hahn was green, exactly as witnesses had described. It was towed to the Ventura Crime Lab. There, criminalists processed the vehicle, searching for any sign of Sherry Daly. Throughout the car, they noticed staining. It appeared to be blood. To find out, technicians used moistened swabs to collect the samples. In the lab, the samples were placed in a tube with a chemical that reacts to blood. If blood is present, the swab turns bluish green. Using this method, Ventura Police Detective Harry Scott got many conclusive results. We found that there was blood on the uh, passenger uh, handle, the door handle on the inside. We found blood and were had been washed uh, up on the uh, ceiling or the headliner area of the car and also some blood in the trunk of the car. Lab work confirmed that the blood was human. But there, investigators reached a dead end. Though they suspected the blood was Sherry's, they had no record of her blood type. But science has new ways around that obstacle. Technicians took blood samples from Daly's parents. From these, they generated DNA barcodes and compared them against the DNA rendered from the blood in the car. The results were unmistakable. The blood found in the car had come from the biological child of Sherry Daly's parents. But it was not an encouraging finding. The presence of her blood throughout the vehicle confirmed their worst fears. 
it was unlikely they would find Sherry alive. Diana Hahn was now the prime suspect. But since they didn't have a body, they couldn't prove that a murder had been committed. The police weren't the only ones looking for answers. This is where the community stepped up and friends of Sherry Daly uh, each weekend morning would gather at the department store where she was abducted and they would go out in search parties. On June 1st, nearly a month after the abduction, searchers noticed the odor of decomposition in a remote location on the outskirts of Ventura. Scouring the area along the embankment, investigators found a human skull. They believed they had uncovered the final resting place of Sherry Daly. Police in Ventura, California, continued searching for Sherry Daly, a young wife and a mother of two who had unexpectedly disappeared. A month after she was reported missing by her husband, investigators believed they had finally found her. The search party combed the scene. In the area where the skull and skeletal remains were found, pieces of jewelry were also uncovered. The items were carefully collected in the hope that someone could identify them as Sherry Dallas. Investigators also found clothing, identical to the outfit Sherry was wearing when she was last seen. Their condition told a lot. We were able to match the clothing uh, to the bones, and we were actually able to determine that there were numerous stab wounds uh, through the uh, shirt and through the bra that showed up on the uh, ribs of the uh, victim. Dental records confirmed that the remains belonged to Sherry Daly. Analysis showed that whoever killed her did so with a vengeance. In addition to the multiple stab wounds, her neck had been severed with a sharp object. The medical examiner concluded that after a long, vigorous struggle, the victim had been nearly beheaded. The autopsy findings were consistent with the blood staining found in Diana Hahn's rental car. And if Hahn had endured a lengthy struggle with Daly, it would explain the scratches and bruising that covered the suspect's forehead and arms during her first interview. Detectives believed that Diana Hahn had killed Sherry Daly, but they didn't think she had planned the murder on her own. Searching Hahn's calling card records from the day of the murder, Detective Skip Young found evidence that her lover had been in on the plot. The day of the murder, we were able to determine that there was at least three telephone communications from Diana Hahn to Michael Daly the morning of the actual kidnapping and homicide. One of the calls was made to him from a payphone just minutes from the ravine where the body was found. It appeared that Hahn was checking in with Daly. Police focus turned back to the victim's husband. Take a look at this one right here. Investigators learned from witnesses that Michael Daly was a drug user and that he'd been flaunting his affair with Hahn for the past few years. We learned from close friends and neighbors that Sherry had reportedly given Michael an ultimatum, clean up your act, knock off the drug use, drop the other woman, and supposedly uh, Sherry was actually seeking the advice of an attorney. Investigators speculated that with Sherry out of the way, Dolly wouldn't have to comply with his wife's demands. He could pursue his new relationship without having to pay alimony or share his children. To detectives' way of thinking, he had a lot to gain from his wife's disappearance. The evidence against Diana Hahn and Michael Daly was damaging, but investigators still hadn't physically connected them to the kidnapping or the murder. If they were going to make a case stick, 
They'd need some evidence proving that Hahn had disguised herself as a blonde law enforcement officer. Again, the close-knit community came forward to help. A clerk who was following the case in the press told police that she remembered selling Diana Hahn a blonde wig sometime before the murder. The clerk also commented that she had noticed a photograph of a man and two children inside Hahn's purse. She assumed the photo was of Hahn's family. Police showed the clerk a photo of Michael Daly and his two kids. It was the same photograph the clerk had seen in Hahn's purse. Investigators learned that Diana Hahn couldn't have children of her own. They began to suspect that Michael Daly had manipulated her with promises of a bright new future. Detectives continued to build their case. They pored over Hahn's financial records, including copies of checks. One of them was written to a large discount store just days before the abduction. The list of items purchased included a piece of poster board, plastic trash bags, a two-piece tan uniform, and a hatchet. Police obtained a warrant to search Hahn's home. They never found the hatchet or the uniform, but they did locate a piece of poster board. The barcode number on the poster board was identical to that recorded on the receipt. They couldn't understand how the board fit on Hahn's shopping list until they took a close look at the shape cut out of it. It was exactly the same shape as a license plate. That explained why witnesses couldn't see a license plate number. Hahn had covered it over with a fake. Okay, so we gotta be pretty serious about how we planned this. But it was unlikely that Hahn um, thought of that herself. What we should do is we should get a wig and... Uh, Investigators believe that Dally masterminded the murder plot well, days in advance. Her, so it looks like she's getting arrested over some Motivated by the lure of a new life with Michael, Hahn was more than willing to dispose of the one thing she believed was standing in their way. Police believe that a disguised Diana Hahn approached problem? Sherry as she was leaving the store parking lot. Pretending to be a law enforcement officer, she lured Sherry from the car and handcuffed her. The staged arrest worked to plan. But investigators believe that Sherry Daly quickly saw through the ruse. It is our belief that within a short period of time after Sherry was abducted in the green vehicle, that she somehow recognized Diana Hahn, disguise and all. We can tell by the damage to the interior of the vehicle, mainly the rearview mirror had been knocked off, that Sherry obviously put up some type of a struggle. But Sherry couldn't fight off her attacker. After driving her to a remote location, Hahn viciously stabbed Dally at least 17 times and placed the body into the ravine. Diana Hahn was arrested for the murder of Sherry Dally on August 1st, 1996. From her jail cell, she reluctantly implicated Michael Daly as the mastermind behind the plot. Daly was arrested the following November. Though the murder investigation had come to an end, Ventura would be forever haunted by the young housewife's tragic end. All she wanted to do was to have a family, have a husband, raise her children. Uh, I still think about this case. I still think about uh, what was going through Sherry Daly's mind when she realized that it was Diana Hahn behind the wheel and she was going to have to fight for her life. Diana Hahn was found guilty of first degree murder and kidnapping. She was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Tried six months later, Michael Daly was also found guilty in the murder of his wife. He was also sentenced to life in prison. 
Diana Hahn and Michael Daly were willing to destroy a family in order to be together. When money is at stake, some family bonds can become twisted and deadly. Nestled in the Rocky Mountains of western Montana, Mineral County is known for its frontier feel. But simple lifestyles aren't immune from deadly mishaps. On November 28, 1995, Chris Hansen's wife Nanette went to the stable to feed the couple's horses. She never came back to the house. Hansen found his 34-year-old wife lying in the mud. She was cold and pale. Hansen called 911. He thought that maybe Nanette had been trampled by horses. It's my wife. She was either dead or dying. The operator immediately dispatched an ambulance. When paramedics arrived, Nanette was not breathing. She had no pulse. All her husband Chris and stepson Scott could do was watch as they attempted to revive Nanette with CPR. At first, paramedics' efforts seemed promising. The victim took a single gasp of air on her own. But that breath would be her last. She was declared dead. Since they performed coroner's duties in this small town, the sheriff's department was also contacted. Chris Hansen told investigators he stumbled upon Nanette's body in the muddy trail next to the horse pasture. He said that after calling 911, he phoned his son, Scott Abe, but there was nothing they could do. Because of his multiple sclerosis, he had very poor eyesight. If he had seen her sooner, he may have been able to save her life. Returning from the accident scene to the Mineral County Sheriff's Department, Under Sheriff Anita Parkin had no reason to believe that Nanette's death was anything but an unfortunate accident. And she did have some bruises that looked like maybe a horse stepped on her or, or something similar of that nature. And with the conditions in the barnyard, I could see where somebody may have been knocked down or, or slipped or something happened of that nature. News of Nanette's death spread through the small 3,000-person community. With it, suspicion swirled. Within hours, friends and neighbors of the victim were calling the sheriff's department to voice their misgivings about the tragedy. No one in the community believed Nanette Hansen's death was an accident. Police in Mineral County, Montana, continued their investigation into the death of 34-year-old Nanette Hansen, accidentally killed by one of her horses. But the community wasn't buying that scenario. Close friends came forward to urge further investigation into Nanette's death. To them, the accident didn't make sense. Nanette was experienced with the care and control of horses. She owned only gentle, slow-moving animals. The Mineral County Prosecutor's Office was receiving calls from the same skeptical friends. But so far, there wasn't any evidence to merit the town's suspicion. Attorney Sean Donovan consulted with the Sheriff's Department. They decided that the only way to dispel the rumors was to have the body autopsied. And we both agreed that just for the sake of putting to rest these concerns that the neighbors had, we ought to just have that done, expecting nothing to turn up. The victim's remains were transported to the state crime lab in Missoula. There, medical examiner Gary Dale was asked to determine what caused Nanette Hansen's death. So generally, in fatal horse accidents, the fatalities are due to skull fractures, cervical fractures, and unless someone's rolled over by a horse. And there was no external evidence of any readily 
fatal type injuries. Uh, the injuries are pretty much consisted of scrapes and bruises. Nanette's skull hadn't been fractured. Her spinal cord was intact. There had been no severe bleeding. The injuries that were found were relatively minor. A network of small scratches on her head and a two inch bruise to the left temple. They shaved the hair overlying the bruise and noticed an unusual pattern on the scalp. They could not immediately identify the source of the injury. Nothing about these injuries fit the profile of a horse trampling. Internal examination of the body turned up a large amount of mud and barnyard debris in the victim's lungs. She hadn't died from trampling. She died of asphyxiation. And in this case, you could make uh, raise a possibility that she was rendered unconscious by a blow, somehow slammed by a horse against the stall of the barn, and went down face first into this muck in the barnyard, and then that she basically drowned or suffocated in that muck. But there was a major fault in that scenario. Nanette had suffered only superficial head injuries. There was no evidence of any brain trauma that would cause her to lose consciousness. A grim new theory formed. There was a fair probability that she was held face down into the ground, into this soft, wet soil by her forearms, by her hands, and that pressure was being applied to her back and to the back of her head. She was basically being forced face first into that. What had initially appeared to be an accident was now being called a homicide. As soon as that happened, we switched from this being a coroner's inquest, which is how this had begun, to being a criminal investigation. With a homicide case opened, the victim's husband, Chris Hansen, was brought in for questioning. They hoped that he could help them find out who might want his wife dead. Though Nanette Hansen's death had been ruled an accident, an autopsy led Montana investigators to open a homicide case. Detectives questioned her husband, Chris Hansen. The many bruises and scrapes on Nanette's body suggested there had been a struggle leading to her death. To find out if Chris Hansen had been on the other end of that struggle, they asked him to remove his shirt. He was covered with what looked Whoa. like fingernail what scratches. Look at that. When asked to explain the marks, he claimed the, that he'd tripped lamp, and fallen lamp, inside the house. Hansen stated that with his multiple sclerosis and near blindness, there was no way he could have physically dominated his wife. Thank you. Though he was telling the truth about his MS, he appeared to be overplaying his handicap. Thanks, so we, we later learned during the investigation that he was able to play dice and, and see the, the different dice, was able to stand beside a pool table and know which number were on, were on the balls, and that he had applied for and received a big game hunting license in 1994. Go ahead and write down your statement as what occurred on that. Though he may have been too weak to work, Everything investigators believed he was strong that. enough to beat up his wife. Nanette's friends and co-workers said that she frequently had black eyes and bruises. Things had been particularly bad, investigators learned, since Chris's son, Scott Abe, came to town. The 31-year-old hadn't seen his father since he was a small boy. About a year before Nanette's death, he came for a visit and decided to stay. He rented a trailer just a few minutes away and started building a cabin on their property. For father and son, it was blissful reunion. Investigators began looking into Abe's background as well. Say bad things about her other than that. A co-worker told investigators that Abe had been very vocal about his hatred of Nanette. He boasted that he could stage an accidental death by nailing a horseshoe to a board and beating her with it. He said he would do anything to keep her from getting her hands on his father's property and inheritance. 
Abe appeared to have gotten his way. Poring over records, detectives learned that in the weeks before Nanette's death, Abe had prompted his father to financially separate himself from Nanette. Hansen complied. He canceled their joint credit cards and opened a new bank account in his name only. It wasn't enough information to make an arrest, but it did get the sheriff's department a warrant to search Abe's property. They searched for any objects that matched the mysterious pattern of cuts and bruises on the victim's scalp. In his trailer, they found a pair of boots. The tread pattern looked eerily familiar. In Abe's car, detectives made another discovery. A homemade weapon called a sap a leather pouch filled with metal objects. The items were sent to the Montana State Crime Lab. Simply believing that the father and son team had killed Nanette was not enough to prove murder. Unless someone could draw an irrefutable link between this evidence and her injuries, the two would never be charged. Investigators' best hope was now in the hands of forensic expert Debbie Hewitt. It's kind of like uh, putting a puzzle together where you pick up this piece of puzzle and pick up this piece of puzzle and see if it, it will fit in the appropriate space. And when you do find that one final puzzle piece, um, you know that you have the complete picture all done. Hewitt began her analysis with the boots. She pressed the treads into an inked pad, then made numerous impressions on clean white paper. These prints were then transferred to clear sheets of acetate. By placing the prints over a life-sized photograph of the wound, she could determine whether the boot made the injury. The sole pattern from Abe's boot matched the injury on Nanette's scalp. Hewitt repeated the same process with the sap, inking and printing the weapon from a variety of angles. When compared against the large bruise on the victim's temple, the last piece of the puzzle had finally fallen into place. The sap was shown to be a perfect fit for the wound on the side of Nanette's head. Father and son had teamed up to do away with the woman who came between them and their greed. You're under arrest for the murder. But their plot didn't hold up to forensic scrutiny. On February 2nd, 1996, Chris Hansen and Scott Abe were arrested. Prosecutors theorized that Abe first stunned Nanette with the sap, then wrestled her into the mud to make it look like an accident. While Hansen restrained her, his son placed his foot on her head, holding her down until she stopped breathing. Had it not been for the insistence of Nanette's close friends, this brutal act would have stayed buried forever. If she had not been rerouted to the pathologist for an autopsy, we never would have seen these particular types of injuries and bruises, and the case would have been written off as an accidental. Both Scott Abe and Chris Hansen were convicted of homicide and sentenced to 60 years in prison. When a murder is cleverly disguised, investigators must find new ways to see through the deception they turned to forensic scientists to reveal the truth and to bring justice to victims who are killed for love or money.